I've been I've been trying to learn to be better in marketing. And one thing that I learned, especially on Twitter, is that you just should be opinionated about things oh, and yeah, like just yeah, yeah. throw these really strong opinions <laughs> and throw the shit in the fan and, and then it will make things, you know, like people will be like, Oh my god, they're talking about this incredible thing. So yeah. th- you need more than fast to reason about programs, right? Mm-hmm. Like that that's a, a very strong, a bold claim that yeah, gave yeah. us some really, really good, interesting discussions, even even in the meetup, which was was pretty cool. Welcome to uh, Kodesnack, uh, Pedro. Hello, thanks for having me. Very excited. Yeah, so for people who are not us, we <laughs> we met at a at a meetup in Gothenburg. Must be about two months ago. Oh wow, that's all of that already. <laughs> time flies. Yes, I mean it, it, it's something like that. I think yeah. I'm not I'm not sure because time. Uh, <laughs> I think so. I think it's around two two months. Yeah. Yeah, but you are not based in Gothenburg. <laughs> No, so um, I'm actually Brazilian, and yep. um, I was traveling through Europe. I also have a podcast in Type Theory, and yes. um, that's how we we bonded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was visiting Gothenburg because of Chalmers University is there, and they're very big into Type Theory. We can talk more about that later because yep. it was extremely exciting. But I was, you know, recording some episodes and hanging around. It was yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What What do you do when you're not making a type theory podcasts oh that's a that's a great question because i don't know i i'm a person have a many different very scattered interests that ah. can be a little a little different for a person who is in cs right uh, yeah. a lot of the cs people that i've met they are have this like hyper focus and like this extreme programmer and oh yes, yes. a lot of <laughs> us are very into gaming I, I love gaming as well but um I also I also spend a lot of time meditating, um, learning more about different kinds of religions and some esoteric stuff. So that's is very odd for for some people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I also love to hike here in Brazil. We have a lot of incredible hikes, amazing waterfalls. Sometimes I go camping. I love being outdoors. We have incredible weather. And one thing that I learned, especially being in um, well. In my travels, and especially in in in, in Gothenburg, is that yeah. Brazilian weather is probably one of the best weathers in, in the world. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm really learning to appreciate that. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean that's one of those great things about traveling. You you really right. start to appreciate what what you have at home as well. <laughs> and it's it's very frustrating because I try to relate that to my friends here, and they cannot really understand the depth of how good things here. No. Are. <laughs> <That makes sense. laughs> No, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I mean, Gothenburg, we, we complain plenty about our weather, but... It's pretty bad. It, it is pretty bad. Well, I was I was in Indiana before this, and they have a lot of snow, so mm. at least it's not that kind of bad. So that, you, yeah. you've got that for you. <laughs> I mean, we have some snow sometimes, but it's not that often, to be honest. No, and not, <laughs> not as heavy either. I assume. No, no, it's true. Right. It's true. Uh, but you are also doing a PhD, right? Well, um, so I was doing a PhD in at Purdue University in in Indiana, USA. Hmm. Ah, but um, yeah, I had some complications. I went through some burnout during COVID. It was very heavy, um, and I ended up figuring that I was not super compatible with the style of the university. My interest with my advisor wasn't going the right way. Yeah. So I decided to just call it off with a master's and I'm still deciding whether I go somewhere to do the PhD. I've been talking to some people in Europe, maybe towards the end of the year, I come back somewhere in Europe for for actually finishing the PhD. Yeah, let's see what happens. I mean, some, yeah. sometimes uh, calling something off is, is absolutely the best thing to do. That's... Yeah, you know, calling um, like in, as if you're paying, paying poker, right? Sometimes it doesn't make sense to just keep paying for no, exactly, for exactly. A lost hand, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, but I think I think something people outside of academia doesn't realize is that it's it's an extremely tough environment and that will put you on the edge all the time, like yeah, twenty four hours. So often enough, you don't have um, weekends off. You know, like it's it's an extremely competitive environment. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I I know I know quite a few people who have done PhDs. I've heard. I I feel like way more negative stories about 
yeah. how things can end up than positive ones. I mean, it does end up great for some people when yes. you get in the right group and you know you have right. a subject you really love. And of course, it can be awesome, but but yeah, there's no point in forcing it through. <laughs> I, I remember someone said when they were doing a PhD in Sweden, uh, what do you call it? The, the the sort of employment contract you have in 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 Swedish in Sweden. It's or at least at that university, it said that the, this. <laughs> this work is uh, what was it something like unbounded in time and place <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're in mars or like if, if you're in another dimension <laughs> yeah exactly you can so, so basically i mean you, you work from anywhere at any time and as much yeah. as you can or want and that's a pretty weird thing to write into a contract at least in sweden <laughs> it's it's yeah and at least well at least you guys have this in con in contract because most of the places that I've seen is kind of like assumed, but nobody talks about it, you know. Ah, yeah, that's which is even worse. In my opinion, yeah, yeah, you know? uh, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're type theory. <laughs> type theory, yes. Uh, it's one of those one of those subjects I hear about every now and then, and uh, I've been thinking for quite a while. It would be really nice to hear from someone who actually knows knows their stuff and w- what it's all about what's exciting about it and everything like that well that's the thing i wouldn't say i know my stuff i'm also trying to learn a couple of things by talking to people that's the great thing about about hosting a, a podcast as well oh yes but um before before i try to answer that um let let me see in in your you are a developer that you are interested in functional programmer uh, in functional programming as i assume your audience as well what do you think comes in mind when you talk about type theory? What usually is the first thing that, like, what is your mental model? It feels like, yeah, it's it's something that comes up uh, trying to make things more reliable and mm. tr- trying to use types. I mean, I think in type, type systems, basic stuff we run across in like Java and TypeScript and stuff, using types in more more advanced ways. Yeah, uh, that's sort of the direction my my thinking goes, and it also feels like something for people who <laughs> who who think who reason about their programming in a more mm. advanced way than I do. Yes, it's like right. they right. they they have some way of looking at things that I would like to know more about. I feel I can't quite grasp it, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that's a great a great starting point. Um, I actually went into Wikipedia to really get you a, a more precise answer of what is type theory. Mm-hmm. Because there there's kind of like two ideas, maybe even three to to go with. And that's why I asked you this initial question so that I can I can have a, a better idea of which which of these ideas should we go deeper into. The first one is that okay, so type theory is deeply rooted into the dawn of com- of computer science you know like it was born even before computers even existed right like when people were were thinking about foundations of mathematics of what are the boundaries of things that we can do in math and that's when the philosophers particularly russell bertrand russell one of the biggest philosophers biggest logicians that existed he came up with this problem of self reference right where you know like this set cannot can be a, a member of itself or not and that leads to all mm. all sorts of contradictions right yeah yeah and the, and this and this paradox comes in in many 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 names right so that is in order to solve this he created this this notion of having this layers of sets, right? So that a set doesn't directly reference itself, but then you can have this next layer of set that can reference the the, the layer below. And the, these layers, he called it types. So that's the first uh, idea that comes with type theory, right? Like this, wow. this is where types first come in. Uh. So that's the dawn of what we are going to call type theory. Because now going forward and really tackling this idea of foundations of mathematics. And then you, we, we would have to talk about Kurt Gödel and, and the halting problem and like really how, how computer science came to be. Yeah. That's when, you know, like um, Alan Turing invented a Turing machine to solve this very foundational mathematical problems of what are the, the boundaries of problems that mathematics can, can even tackle. Right. But at the same time, there was this other guy that is, that is, is, often a little kind of like left aside that also solved the same problem as Alan Turing called Alonzo Church 
Aaron Turing, he invented uh, the universal machines that we, we call these days as uh, Turing machines. But Alonso Church, he invented the lambda calculus. Yes. And the lambda calculus had a similar problem as Russell sets, right? That's naive set theory. And there is this problem of self-reference that would break break things. And he solved the problem with exactly the same solution as Rus- Russell, as having this stratification, which he called, we call it types, right? Hmm. So that's where that's where type theory starts actually being type theory. It's like is this notion of lambda calculus, also this notion of computability of computers with these stratifications that things uh, now have these these notions of um, classes of like okay we're talking about this these classes of elements that we're going to call this type and this type kind of shapes somehow these values right so it's kind of like a we're talking about how 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 we can bundle kind of values together, and with with a lot of research, a lot of being uh, smart about how to represent our data and our programs, we can get very deep into the the, the kinds of things that we can represent with these types, right? With this lambda calculus. So, what is type theory, in my point of view, and I think it's a it's a fair way to portray it i would say it's the it's the research of programming languages in, mm. in its depth right um really going into the more mathematical side of things right really really um being concerned about making things correct and what are the foundations of what we, we are achieving right we really try to respect this, the foundations of, of computer science itself. So when we, when we speak about type theory, we're usually also speaking about programming languages, especially in the US, it usually is usually the, they go hand in hand, like type theory or programming languages research is kind of seen as the same thing in this way where we're really looking on, on a very abstract way, what is our programming? What our programming languages look like? What are the features that our programming languages can have and are they going to be correct? How things can go wrong? Why should I, can I add this particular notion and not that other particular notion? How do they go together with one another? And I think it also, um, having, having this notion of type theory in this way also answers another question is, you know, um, um, why should, should we as programmers um, really care about type theory is because if you really want to go beyond what is kind of like the obvious, oh, I'm just going to make my new language here and add this new feature. But like that, that's already type theory in my point of view. We were actually I were already thinking about what are the, the things that I can add to, to my language in a, in a novel way. Because in the end of the day, if you, if you squint your eyes enough, most of the things that people try to add to their, to their language have already been done in like the 70s, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we don't, we don't know that because, you know, like sometimes these papers that these, these, ide- these ideas were developed were it's very hard to understand for someone who is outside of, it, of the academia, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know, like in a way, type theory is kind of this way to talk about programming languages, but in a more mathematical sense, in a more formal means, right? Yeah. So a type is somewhere deep down basically a set of things is that yeah that's i think that's a fair a fair way to to look into it like you can think of of types as um a way to 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 talk about a group of elements right so you say oh i have this type of nets you you're already thinking of all these numbers that go into this type of nets right yeah. Oh, I have this type of floating floating point number. So you have this this way to build a floating point number, like what it means to be a floating point number, or strings, the same thing. Like you 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 already have not only not only this the idea, but a way to represent them. Like it, it's it's bundled together with the way they're being represented by your computer, or sometimes even by by your mem- the memory of your computer, mm-hmm. right? Depending on how. Um, how strong the type system of your language is, more guarantees, more information you have about the shape of your of your data. Yeah. Let's put it that way. That's why that's why, for example, I think programming languages researchers in general are very excited about Rust, because Rust is is a much more powerful type system than say C, right? Mm. Because now you have these guarantees about how your memory behaves and how, you know, um, is this 
is this part of memory being used right now? Is it borrow, borrowed already? Am I going to have a, a no pointer exception somewhere? Like yeah. it doesn't, you don't have to deal with that at runtime because, you know, type systems is also an information of the, your, the statics of your program. You don't need to run anything. You already know how things will behave. You are guaranteed to behave mathematically by the shape of the structures of the data, right? So the more structure that you have in your program language, the, the more strong of your type system, more of the, these guarantees that they can, they can possess, they will possess, right? And then, and then you get stronger, you can get stronger and stronger type systems all the way up to what we call these days dependent types, right? And with dependent types, things now you're in this nirvana of type <laughs> systems because... <laughs> It's, 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 it is a nirvana because now math and, and computer science, they just merge. <laughs> they, they are not two different things anymore. They're the same. They're one and only. And you can do both as if they're, you're doing one or the other. They're the same thing at that point, right? All right. <laughs> many, many interesting steps along the way there. <laughs> so, 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 so as, a, as, a, as a working everyday uh, programmer, would I like my programming language to, to to reach the type nirvana, or are or, or, or there steps along the way that are, are more useful to me in my day to day work than others? That is that is a very good question because that's the thing. There is always a price to pay, right? And and you're you're the developer here. You're much better equipped to answer that question in, <laughs> in this sense than than I am. In the sense of like you know, programming dependent types is can be very, very time consuming. It's not everything that you're gonna you wanna be doing all your proofs all the way down. It's gonna be very sometimes you have to hire PhD students <laughs> to even be able to reason about what is going on, right? So one thing that researchers are very, very excited these days is what we call lightweight formal methods or, you know, like something something in the middle. So, for example, take liquid liquid types, for example, which is this Haskell extension where, you know, you have str a, a stronger type system than Haskell. So you can have more constraints about the shape of your programs and what your programs are supposed to do. And then instead of going down and, and proving things about, about how your program is expected to behave, you they send it to a set solver and set solver do it do it itself, right? Mm. So there is this extremely hot field of research going on right now in this the sense of more lightweight formal methods, lightweight type theory somehow, where instead of, you know, like making things easier for the end day programmer. I think another thing that is, that is very exciting, exciting in this field is also um, fuzzy testing or property-based testing. Yeah, and yeah. what property-based testing means there is for Haskell, there is quick check, right? where you can write the property of what are the, the kind of tests that you want to run, and then it will kind of generate all of the possible scenarios, all of the possible corner cases for that particular property. And then you can have a much stronger guarantee that that property will hold for your program, for whatever function you're, you're talking about. Yeah. So going back to your, to your original question, um, why I think an interesting question here is, why should a programmer care about type theory? And um, I want to I want to give a, an, another answer where which is a little more philosophical. Yes. Because again, as I said at the beginning of the episode, usually you know, like the the person who is a programmer is like this. You know, a lot of us are kind of like these nerds that like math and like to stay on a computer. And I have this feeling that you know, like the day to day nine to five can be sometimes a little bit excruciating and you just like get want to get your job over with and let's just implement this other thing <laughs> and next next year you're going to implement something that is kind of similar and you just keep doing kind of the same thing again ah whatever it's just a yeah. job you know <laughs> so so the other the other answer that i want to give is is a little bit more of of art let's put it this way i think for me type theory is the math of computer science in, in the sense of Type theory is is really beautiful. You know, it's really looking for your programs, for your for the things that we do in a very philosophical, almost in a very abstract level that is really going down to the meaning of what is going on. I would say, you know. So one thing that I think it's severely under thought in universities right now 
is something called uh, Curry Howard isomorphism, right? So we were talking about this this nirvana mm-hmm. where you know computer science and mathematics ceases to to have a difference, and and I would even put one more there, which is logic. So logic, computer science, and mathematics just just ceases to have boundaries, right? And the na- the formal name of this is the Curry Howard isomorphism. And in, in my point of view, the only the only other thing in computer science that is as beautiful as this is the halting problem itself. So like the halting problem is, is absolutely beautiful. If if you know like you, you when you sit down to really learn what it means and what are the consequences in math and, and what in what we do, is like well, it turns out that the, the the reason why computer computers even exist to begin with is because of this weird paradox <laughs> of self-reference, right? Like what is even going on here? Yeah, yeah. It's it's beautiful. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's incredible, and and it blows my mind that Alan Turing had like twenty two or twenty four years when he yeah. came up with that. It, pfft, that guy is an incredible genius. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But then, but then there was this. You know, like he went to to Princeton and did his PhD, and and at the same time there were other students from Alonzo Church that was thinking about about you know like this computability things, and they came up with this notion that you know. And the very formal, precise notion that computer science, that programming, that logic, and that mathematics are actually the same thing. You know, like what when you when you're coming up with a program is the same thing as when you're doing a proof in logic, and and there are some some other consequences relating to category theory that things get even more and more abstract and and crazy, and it's it's absolutely beautiful. So. Um, why should we, for me, why people should care a little more about type theories exactly because it's, it's really beautiful for me. It has this deep sense of awe and, and incredible depth that, you know, like it's hard. I think, I think it's, it's underappreciated in today's society where we want everything fast. We want to do, to, to make sure things just, just work or, you know, like how can I get money out of this? You know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's art. Art yeah. is very important for human endeavor, I think. And math for me is a, is a kind of art, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely beauty in an art. Beauty in in, exactly. in all its forms, De- definitely underappreciated, because it can lead you to make things which are um, different, if yeah. uh, from from other other approaches, and something that makes you more excited, creates a new idea in you, what have you. It, some things can't have you know serious numbers on them to be measured. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. A quick but huge thank you to everyone sponsoring us on Coffee. You too can become one of them by surfing to co-fi.com/kodsnack snack and uh, giving us either a one-time donation or monthly support. If you support us on the coffee drinker level of five euro per month or more, you get a bunch of very nice stickers in your actual physical mailbox. And if you support us on the barista level for 10 euros per month or more, you also get a thank you right here. Big thanks to Almin Gruen, Svante Richter, Anders Legel, Brother Ingo and Tobbe Lundberg. Everyone who supports us helps make the podcast possible and the more of you there are, the better we can make the podcast. We do sometimes have sponsors, but it's actually your support which is making it possible to cover our monthly costs. And if you want to support us in other ways, you can, of course, give the podcast a review in your podcast player. That also helps a lot. Give it a thumbs up, a star, write a comment, or whatever your player supports. Or, of course, simply tell someone who might like the podcast about an episode. And remember, you're a fantastic person, whether you support us or not. But, but yeah, so, so it sounds like... Or, or it feels like to me, like, like uh, the type theory and stuff. It, it can be can be really useful as a sort of a, a different way of thinking about the problem I'm trying to solve with my code, like reasoning about it in a more abstract way, and then <laughs> and I don't know applying the types I have available, perhaps in my language, to implement that uh, in a second step or adjust. You know. Sometimes, sometimes when I'm when I'm talking with people who are just started learning functional programming, for example, it I, I feel it's always kind of like very surprising how very different it is than than imperative programming, right? Mm-hmm. Because when you're is it is it safe to assume that your audience are have have experience with some functional programming? I, w- I would say most people, and and if mm-hmm. not, we'll we'll add links, <laughs> plenty of them. <laughs> Go learn some Haskell right away, or <laughs> exactly. some old camel, or something. Right? <laughs> 
and we could we should make pure episodes. Yes. The thing the thing is when when you start learning these languages that we call functional programming languages, things are very different. It almost feels as if you're learning how to program all over again because you know um it's it's more kind of about the the specification and then you're you're writing down the type signature that you want to achieve and usually you're you're, you're so like the, the type system is so strong that because you wrote, you wrote that type signature you really sometimes you can be really constrained on the things that you can do that that you know you don't have that much flexibility on how to implement so yeah. it's it often enough is a lot more about getting the the declarations right getting the the ideas right on how things are put together than the actual implementation and that and that is that is really really cool right because you know like if you go back to thinking of oh oh um, object oriented programming that's kind of like what they're trying to achieve, right? Like, I want to think on the how things relate to one another. That's yeah. one of the most important concepts when you're programming, right? And you kind of get that a little more for free in, in functional programming language. So I feel that's a really strong setting point and a, a good position of why people start falling in love with functional programming. Not to say, again, I, I for me, the reason why people start falling in love with functional programming is because it gets you so much closer to this mathematical beauty, right? Because now you, you look at this program, you, you, you're very constrained on how it, it, you already know what is the type signature, how it should behave. And now, you know, the, the implementation kind of falls off. But even reading this implementation, it's, it's, sometimes it's a lot more beautiful, right? Like there is this one function that things are being thread through one another. And sometimes you don't even need to talk about, about the you know, like the arguments of the functions at all. You just, you know, like concatenate and, and you're smart on how to put these functions together and poof, all of a sudden you don't even need to talk about the variables. And it's <laughs> incredible, right? It's really cool. There are all sorts of incredibly cool things that you can do. And you, you it kind of like pulls you off like little... It's almost like this little devil on the side calling you, hey, come do more math here. Come here. And then slowly you start going down deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden you're learning monads and modus transformers and lenses. And, and you just go down from there, right? <laughs> so if it can be described, what are sort of the steps along the way? Because you mentioned like dependent types is over here in sort of Nirvana land. And then there's Haskell somewhere along the line. And people were playing with like stronger or more powerful type systems for Haskell mm -hmm. and then there was rust somewhere along there what, what, what are sort of the what, what sort of the path I don't think there is there is a line to be entirely honest no. I think yeah I think I think it depends on what are the needs of the project and what people can want to do and how do you want to achieve them but um I think I think on the on the, the 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 highest point there's definitely you know interactive theorem provers how we call mm -hmm. them you know like these dependent types doesn't have to be dependent types. There is Isabel and Hall, which okay, so this doesn't is have dependent types. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, like there is this notion where you will be doing your, like the strong type system. And there is this notion that you will be doing your proofs kind of by hand. That is the, the highest end where things start getting really collapsing between computer science and math, right? Uh. And, then, and then below that, I would say there are systems like Daphne, like um, Daphne so is the system, this, this language that you can give pre and post conditions, you know, on, on your functions. And again, they also send those for an SMT solver to check if, if they hold mm. uh, through a strong system. Uh, there's liquid types there, you know, like this light, lighter weight methods. Uh, there is Saw and Crucible, um, Galois, it's this R&D company, very, very incredible R&D company in the US, where they have this tool called Saw, where they, you can annotate your C programs to check for invariance in a similar Ooh. way as, as, as Daphne, as, as Liquid Types, but you know, like all the way to C programming. And, and, and they also apply some techniques called symbolic execution where they transform your C program into this logical formula and put together these, pre these conditions, print post conditions and send to an SMT solver to check if things go right. Mm. Um, the issue with those tools is because when they work, they're amazing. They mm -hmm. work really well. But um, when they don't, it can be really hard to debug. Like SMT solvers debugging can be really hard, right? So there is... Um, it's important to also mention these this, this solvers like Z3, CVC5, uh, and others. 
where they can be very interesting uh, along those ways. And then after that, I think, you know, everyday function, I think, I think it's fair to put functional programming languages in the next layer here because again usually functional programming languages have a much stronger type system than your everyday programming language you know they have very strong static typing guarantees and often often these functional programming languages they have some type theory researchers writing papers about them so they really want to make sure that things are right and uh, they they really work as, as they're intended to work so there is a lot of theory a lot of very formal theory so yeah, so functional programming languages, they can have these extremely strong type systems where, you know, like they really give you some kind of stronger guarantees and they give you... Another thing that functional programs usually care about is this notion of purity, which, you know, like each function doesn't touch, doesn't use any any global variables, ah, for yeah, example. Yeah. They, they, they usually do not exist in functional programming languages. There is yeah. no... There, it's often the case that it's even impossible to even touch something that has a global state, hmm. right? And they call this pure functions, purity, right? And yeah. that's usually a really, a really good thing too because it doesn't break modularity among your other things, right? So it gives you these this extra guarantees. And then, and then there's these newer, stronger langu- languages like, like Rust, right? Where again, it's not all the way to these pure functional program languages, but they are implementing these amazing type systems that they, you can see that there is a lot of research effort behind the, behind it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there is another language that I think it's it's really under underappreciated in the community, which is C sharp. C sharp had these notions oh. of of folds and lists, extremely well done with link all the way back like thousand five or something like it's been there for a long time yeah. and and like way before java 8 that started introducing those ugly ugly ass streams right <laughs> oh, yes, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and c sharp was doing it right from to mm-hmm. begin with you know ah. so i think it's really underappreciated cool um but yeah i think i think those are I think I think Java in in some sense is also kind of underappreciated because they have this very strong static typing as well. You can have your opinions whether it's a good, bad, or like how OO shaped well or badly mm-hmm. our our community, but you really have to give credit why Java rose the way it rose historically, right? And we could talk about all the run um, compile once run run everywhere thing, which was very important back then. But in, in the terms of type systems, it, it, it was, it had a, a strong opinion on how things should be done. Yeah, yeah. And in general, for, for, for type theory, for our programming languages, things that we're doing, that's usually a good thing to have. Even though you, you get your opinion is not great, it's still, it's still better than, than nothing, than not having yeah. it, right? Yeah. And another, a, a final point that I, that I want to make on the bottom line of like the bottom of this list, right? Like all the way from dependent types to no types, mm-hmm. let's put it that way, you know, like yeah. it's dynamic types such as Python. Um, it, it's very interesting to look into it because usually programming languages research despise dynamic type languages. <laughs> exactly because, well, you throw away everything that I have to work with. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> am I going to do, right? <laughs> no guarantees at all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but I, I mean, um, you have to be pragmatic, right? Um, again, it's you've got to choose the tool that is right for your job. And I mean, Python is my everyday program language for obvious reasons. Right? You just, I just want to get some some things done. Let's just 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 do it. Things yeah. are going to be wrong on the way. I do not care. Let's just just do it. Let's make it fast. Give me this library that has been implemented thirty times by forty different people. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so the different levels they have their places for different things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so Rust's type system is one of the the stronger by the sound of it, or yeah, yeah. or powerful. I would ones. say so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What is it that, for example, Rust's type system doesn't do that would bring it further along the same <laughs> the same axis or bring it to another level or? <sighs> I'm not an expert in Rust by no means. I I really so one thing. One thing that I think that functional program mean usually care about is the notion of, of data types, right? Mm-hmm. Algebraic data types. And the reason why algebraic data types is so important is because of pattern matching. 
right? Mm. And and I think you know, like these newer languages, such as Rust, such as Scala, such as even 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 Java, I think it has some notion of of pattern matching. Am I getting it wrong? No, no, I think I think you're right. It's one of those things that's starting, you know, it's spreading yeah. into all the languages. And I think it's one. great. Mm -hmm. It's it's really really good. So for us to have algebraic data types is 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 really nice. It's really good. I'm not sure if it gets all the the things that that we usually care about in pattern matching. So for example, you shouldn't be able to extend your data types because mm -hmm. then you you would simply like it's easy to break pattern matching, right? And it would break your functions too easily. Uh -huh. But um, in order in order to get more power, like to put Rust up above in these categories, I would expect some. I don't know if it exists. Maybe it's an interesting research idea that I'm th throwing out there. Property-based testing would be incredible. It would be really good. I think it's hard to go back. Like, if you do not get purity from, from the get-go, it's hard to recover that. Mm. So I think that it, on its own kind of, like, gets well stuck on how higher up this ladder it could go, ah. you know? Because, yeah. yeah, without purity, things, you know, like in, in a type system way, things would just not be great to reason about. It's mm -hmm. much, much harder to reason about your language without purity. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, it's about being able to reason about more and more yes. things and have stronger and stronger guarantees, more or less. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. But again, I'm not I'm not a, an expert in Rust, so no, I'll, no, I'll no. stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We're we're, not, <laughs> we're being more general here. If someone wants to drop mm -hmm. in and be an expert on Rust, please contact me. We'll make a great episode. <laughs> oh, I think I think I have someone for you. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I I don't know if you said this during the meetup or if it's on one of the podcast episodes, but you you said at some point that we need more than tests to reason about our programs, mm -hmm. and I feel like that that connects a lot after hearing. After listening yes. to this, talking about this for a while, that types yes. really are another way of reasoning about it. I've been I've been trying to learn to be better in marketing, and one thing that I learned, especially on Twitter, is that you just should be opinionated about things oh, and yeah. like just yeah, yeah. throw these really strong opinions <laughs> and throw the shit in the fan, and and then it will make things. You know, like people will be like, "Oh my god, they're talking about this incredible thing." So yeah. th you need more than tests to reason about programs, right? Mm -hmm. Like th that's a, a very strong, a bold claim that yeah, gave yeah. us some really, really good, interesting. Really interesting um, discussions, even even in the meetup, which was was pretty cool. But yeah. uh, the the bottom line that that I want to that I usually want to get around is this: when we're talking about 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 functions, about programming, you know, like when you you're writing down a function, usually, even though the memory is bound, so you you you're talking about some finite data. You know, the idea of that data, mathematically speaking, is usually infinite. Yeah. Right. So in order for you to prove this mathematical property of your function, you are you are usually bound to need something more than than tests in each case, right? Because if your domain is infinite, right? If you know like if if you this function accepts natural numbers, for example, you can test it until the universe ends and you're not and <laughs> testing all the all the yeah. all the points right yeah, yeah. so you need you need to be a little more a little more you need a, a better technique than just testing if you really want the 100% guarantee assurance that this code will always work for every single element in this domain and this is usually what we call is usually you want to do some some kind of induction right because usually these types, these this domains that we're working with are, are inductively defined, right? Like there is some sort of recursion and this means that there is this induction hypothesis. Like there are some, some, some guarantees that you can bootstrap to reason about all the elements on, on, your, on your input, right? Because when, you, when you're building a data type, like again, we, we go back to this notion of algebraic data types, right? Because algebraic data types is usually you have this, this initial case, um, this um, base case, and then the, the, the steps, the, the induction steps, right? The, the, the recursive parts of your data, right? So mm. if you think of natural numbers, you have this base case, which is zero, and you have the, the successor, which the successor recursively builds another number based on a smaller number. 
Yeah. Right. So usually when we're talking about 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 programming, that's the kind of, of, of data we're talking about. There's usually something along those lines. Yeah. So we know how to reason about this kind of data. It's called induction, right? So again, it's, it's this tie between between math and computer science because induction and recursion are actually the same thing by the Curry Howard isomorphism, mm. right? So here, when when I'm I'm speaking about you will need more than tests to reason about about our programs. Well, it depends, right? It depends the kind of program we're talking about, right? Like if 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 I'm just if I'm building this program that I just wanna build this script to scrape some tweets, I do not care if it works. I, I wanna I just wanna see some 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 tweets over there. Mm-hmm. I can check it's whatever. It's not it's not gonna make my plane crash, right? <laughs> But now if I'm if I'm an airplane and then, you know, like it depends on some software, I want to be really sure that this plane <laughs> is not going to crash. How do I do this? Well, I can test. I can test a lot. I can test a lot, a lot. But always you cannot have this 100% guarantee. You cannot be entirely sure that you cover all the, the, the possible cases in the domain of all your functions Mm. And I guarantee that you cannot get there because the domains are going to be something kind of infinite, right? And yeah. you cannot test all of those. So you need you need some more kind of formal guarantees. And, you know, dependent types is, is a technique that you can use to get some really, really strong guarantees to do that. Sometimes it doesn't pay off because, you know, um, maybe, maybe it's going to take more years to build that than, than you care, right? That by by the time that I finish proving that the the plane is correct, it's already 2050, and <laughs> we're not doing anything. No, come on, we have to be we have to be physical here, right? We care yeah. about making things that that are gonna work. So you know, like this lightweight formal methods that we're talking about is is a great middle ground, right? We can may, maybe we can go down to dependent times to really really reason about these tricky properties or having some kind of model of my problem and really get down and understand what is going on under the hood. But, you know, like when I'm talking about the implementation, then maybe we can find something in the middle, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was also something I think you, you went in or that was discussed in one, one of those, must be one of those awesome episodes with Cornel Elliott. Mm-hmm. There was some, some discussion there at some point about, right. yeah, you know, you have the theory, but, but then, of course, the implementation can be completely yes. different stuff. And I, right. that's something I think about, I mean, regularly or on and off as well. Like the implementation is just the implementation. The the general idea of what it's supposed to do, that's really poorly encoded into the code you write. Right. It should yes. it probably should live much more explicitly somewhere else. Yes, that's why it's so important to choose to choose the language you're gonna be working with exactly for, you know, like what are what are the properties that I want to maintain here, right? Like, can I can I even express some of the things that I care? Yeah. And I think in that episode with Conno Elliott, he he's very strong on going back to the roots and really thinking about not only not only the model, not only how do my properties relate to another one another, but also what are the fundamental properties that I want my system to uphold. Mm. And I think this is this is something that sometimes is a little taken for granted in in any industry. And I mm. think that's that's a point that he he his frustration really shows in that episode. Like he want to go back and really talk about the properties of my system. So he he's a big believer on this this notion of denotation, right? Really talking about. The, um, if you go to the roots of, of this word denotation, what it means is, is exactly that, mean, meaning. Mm. It, when you say this denotes that, you're saying this, the real meaning of this is that, right? So mm. what he's questioning here is, what is the meaning of my program? What does it mean to get this, this, this system correct, the system right? So he, he, his approach is to really bring this up front, right? Yeah. And... Uh... I'll link the episodes, of course, in the show notes. People should really go listen to them. They are long, <laughs> but you, so you yes. don't need to take them in one sitting, but they are incredible. <laughs> That's all I It's one of my favorites for sure, because he, he yeah. has so much philosophy. He really go like, the name of the episode, by the way, is like the lost elegance of computation. Yeah. So like we really try to come up with this beautiful name for the episode, exactly because he goes extremely deep. What is the meaning? What does it mean? To compute, yeah. to to 
to program even. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's also something to pick up. As, 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 <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess as, as the industry in general, as working programmers to think a bit more about, you know, the meaning and the reason and mm. not just get caught up in adding another if statement to fix <laughs> to fix a bug, but yes. maybe, maybe take ourselves a bit more seriously and think a bit more about the model, uh, whether it's in the term of types or some, at some other level. Uh, and and can be can be really hard too, right? Like I don't yeah. I don't want to blame the programmers by no means because no, we no. live in this extremely fast paced society where you just have to get things working. Like come on, do it right, fast, quick. No. And they're just okay. Let's just put this if state. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You, you don't have time to to go back and really okay. What what does it mean yeah. for my program to be? Nope, there you go. Tesla was already announced and we lost our due date, right? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but some sometimes when you do take the time to figure out a, a model and what the types involved are, you end up building something that's much more stable and easier to but, reason about and easier to extend because of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a case for not pondering too much or uh, getting stuff out and see what works. Yeah. But, I mean, we have some, the stuff I see at work that has been the most recent about is also the stuff that has held up the best. <laughs> and yeah. you can find some really, really old code that, yeah, it's written once and then it wasn't touched <laughs> because yep. it still does the right thing and it doesn't need to change that much. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's also one of those perhaps a little bit underestimated trade-offs. Yeah. There. yeah. Everyone's so so focused on being fast but yeah yeah hmm. <laughs> i i think we have to schedule more episodes <laughs> there, there's, there's so much interesting stuff everywhere but yeah, we, have, we have at least a few minutes left right now as well um, mm -hmm. and i feel like we really should promote your podcast a bit more as well because that's such a such, such a gold mine <laughs> if you want to start digging down into type theory so yeah what what is your podcast and where 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 did that come from um okay so the story of of type theory for all when i was in brazil so i started i started learning more about type theory like believe it or not it's really like looking back it's, i feel it's really odd that my first fun functional programming language was cock so like i didn't <laughs> learn haskell i didn't like okay i went all the way down to dependent types Okay, it was extremely hard. It was really tough, but it, it was it was awesome. I, I felt it was love at first sight. I really really appreciated that. Okay, and the the thing the thing about about you know like wanting to learn more of these things in Brazil, and especially back then, this was like. 13, 15 years ago. No, not hmm. 15. I'm not that old. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> Maybe 10, 10 or, yeah. or 11 years ago. 10-ish? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, there, there was a lot less material on these mm -hmm. topics. And so by, by the so it was really hard. I remember like I would just hang out on 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 IRC of all things. Like mm. I think I think people nowadays like this new generation doesn't even know what IRC is, right? <laughs> no, it's just <laughs> us, us old people. <laughs> right. And and I would just hang out at, at, at COG IRC and they would be very helpful and give me extremely good pointers. Software foundations didn't exist back then. So software 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 foundations is usually how people learn cock these days. It's like it's usually an entry point for dependent types. All hmm. of those, like there was nothing about type theory basically. And by the time I, I, I was graduating, this type theory podcast came, came about. And I really felt kind of like, somehow I felt kind of connected to the, to the community. Sometimes I felt like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm learning something, right? Like this is a way to learn these ideas that I'm passionate about. And it was kind of like, the only thing right and you know I, I ended up with all the things i i went to this programming language summer school in the us which i highly recommend anyone interested in these topics i'm always talking about this my podcast as well um and and then i learned how i went there and i was like i just felt even more in love and i decided to do my phd so i went to the us and all of that and and by that time this type theory podcast was over like the the guys doing this just discontinued, mm. oh. and and I was you know I was I was pretty upset because it 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 played a major role in my life in my career right, mm. 
And by COVID, I was literally just bored. I was like, why don't I? Like, I want it. Why don't I yeah. just do it myself? Yeah, and there's like, something missing here. I can feel this. Yeah, thing. yeah. So I, that, that's how that's how it came about. Like, there was yeah. no major inspiration. It's like, I want, I want it. Doesn't exist. I'll make it happen. You yeah, know? yeah. And then as, as things go, I try. You know, like I try to sell it. I try to get things out of it. Especially now that I, you know, like I'm basically, you know, like looking for what are the next things. Like, what do I want to grow the podcast? Do I want to get some sponsorship? So. I was in Europe looking for for those those things too, and you know ha- having a podcast is, is is really really funny. Like talking to people like me. If if it wasn't for it, I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, it's a good it's a good thing to. I, I, I joke that I sometimes I send an email to, the, to a professor, and you know like. Basically, what I'm doing is, hey, can you give me a class on this particular <laughs> topic for two hours? And oh, yeah. and by the way, let's let's make it available for the public. Yeah, yeah. Really, it's, it's I'm asking him to give me some class, but teach me something for two yeah, hours yeah. Right? <laughs> for free, for completely yeah. free. This incredible person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's amazing. It's really really good. And I and I I I'm always bring, trying to you know, like someone sometimes say. Uh, hey, I I wish I could have a podcast. And I'm like, yeah, you should do it. Like, do another type three podcast. Like, do things that I'm not yeah. doing. Like, it's gonna, I think it's gonna everyone is gonna win. It's gonna be yeah, great. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, definitely. Don't want to gatekeep anything either. No. You know, like I think I think there is not enough. There, there's just nothing be, like other than than type three for all. There is one or two other podcasts in, hmm. in this like this like really type theory. There is a Church of Logic with Cody Rue. He's incredible. He's extremely, extremely smart. I think he's did his PhD at, at CMU or something. Hmm. He's extremely smart, so he his his episodes are really short, just just teaching something. And okay. then there is the Type Theory Commute by Aaron Stump. Stump. Aaron Stump on. Um, he's from Iowa. I don't know if if he's there anymore. Hmm. And then there is there is some others. There is more, you know, like these lightweight formal methods, like. Hmm. And um, there is building better systems, which I think they stopped it as well. Hmm. And there are others. I, I can show you some some other things in the link if you want. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, there's definitely a slot to be filled. And like you said, everyone wins. The more voices there exactly. are. I mean, it's yes. the same thing. We started this podcast because we thought there were <laughs> too too few, at least. Yeah. developer podcasts around here and i think there still are it's a little yeah. bit better but but we nobody loses when there's another one that's yes yeah well, another thing that I, exactly and go, talk, meeting other podcasters as well i remember we were talking about this this shorts that you that you that you started doing right i want to oh, start yeah, yeah. doing that for for type theory for all as well yeah. because like it's a, an easy and good way to advertise the episodes because yeah. my th- that's the thing about type theory for all as well your your episodes are one hour. Mine are like two or three. Yeah. So like people are not gonna watch that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like I I understand that it's kind of like very niche. It's already a niche topic with you know like you really have to want to get this information uh, out yeah. of there. <laughs> yeah, but it's a fantastic resource once you do want it. It's, yes, yes. And, uh, I, I hope mean, so. I, I hope yeah, so. and I think I think people are. People are surprisingly good at, you know, consuming large pieces of content as well. Uh, I mean, I, d- I do it regularly and uh, other people just prefer to do it in video so they can see the people talking as well. It's, uh, yeah, I want to I start recording the video, but it makes makes things so much harder to yeah. edit and to put things yeah. together. It's, yeah, that's what's, what's what's even keeps more me away work. from it as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's about time to wrap up for today like i said I, I strongly feel we should do more episodes because i feel we just scratch the surface <laughs> on everything That's, yeah I'm, I'm down i'm down let's yeah. do it i had a lot of fun it was really really fun talking about this sometimes i'm i'm, I'm really i'm really surprised by you know uh, it's something I, I i noticed during the phd because you know like you're doing your phd and every day you're reading these these papers which are like extremely confusing and hard to understand you're feeling like you're the the most dumb <laughs> person on on earth right and you know like these people are incredible because they wrote this in the 60s right and yeah and i cannot understand this anymore yeah yeah and then and then after a couple of years i go down and i talk to an undergrad i'm like like i can explain in depth these concepts to them and and i'm always surprised i'm like oh 
I did learn something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how did I do that? <laughs> so this is exactly how I'm feeling right now. So yeah. I feel really good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and we'll, of course, link everything in the show notes. Like yep. I said, uh, it's, everything's there. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Pedro, for, for today. Thank this was you. extremely interesting. Tack för att just du lyssnar på Kodsnack. Om du vill stödja oss, varför inte tipsa en bekant om podden? Eller lämna en recension i till exempel iTunes eller något annat ställe där det går att sätta betyg på poddar. Du kan också stödja oss genom att köpa oss en kopp kaffe på Koffi. Ko-fi.com kodsnack. Alla pengar går direkt till att göra podden bättre och trevligare. Du kan också komma och hänga i vår Slack-kanal. Länk finns på kodsnack.se precis som alla andra länkar och alla annan info kopplat till varje avsnitt. Sist men inte minst finns det också en länk till vår Spreadshop-butik där du kan köpa tröjor och andra prylar med kodsnacktryck. Återigen, tusen tack för att du lyssnar. Vi hörs. Let me put it this way, Mr. Raymer. The 9000-series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000-computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error.